Hi there, my name is Michael Savoldi. I was a professor of farrier science at the California State Polytechnic University in Pomona, California. And I was also the resident farrier for the W.K. Kellogg Arabian Horse Center for 30 years. Our subject today is going to be the upright hoof capsule. I love the saying pathology never lies because we will be looking at pathology today and uh, applying it to the things we learn in this foot. So here's our specimen. This will be a necropsied foot because we're going to dissect it. It was, it was collected at a local rendering plant for research purposes and educational uses. And you will see some anatomical photographs uh, of gross anatomy. So I just kind of give you a heads up on that one. So what are we referring to when we talk about an upright hoof morphology? Uh, by the way, morphology is the study of shape. So we're just talking about straight or upright sidewalls on your horse's foot. And if we were to look at a lateral view, lateral means the furthest away from the body. So this would be the outside portion of the foot. And we're looking at the vertical depth in the heel area. Then there's a couple other things we can notice, simple things we can notice at this time. And that is these feet may develop a high dish in this area. A dish simply means that the wall is bending outward. Let's see if I have a little piece of paper here. So the wall is, this would normally be the hoof wall and it's been, it's causing it to bend outward like this. So creating this forward dish. Then this foot can also develop a low dish that's developing down here. And, and in this area, we can see two, usually two forces that cause this. One is the capsule shearing. Uh, it, well, when the foot comes back, it has to push off the toe. And if the toe length of wall is long, then it can pick up leverage and pull that dish out in that direction. I would say that the majority of causes of this dish in the toe is the P3 bone is, is lowering in its elevation within the hoof capsule, becoming more uh, positive palmar angle. When I talk about feet, I like to refer to the capsule in nautical or aviation terms. So in other words, I'll talk about a forward pitch. This foot would be in a forward pitch or a backward pitch. I talk about roll if it's if it's leaning to one side or the other. And then yaw because the foot can yaw around. Most of the yaw is um, the bone will yaw because the capsule can move around the bone. The, bo the bone can move something like this inside the capsule like this. I shouldn't say the bone, the bone's connected, excuse me. The bone is connected to the, the P2 bone, this bone is. So usually it's the capsule yawling around the toe of the bone in different directions. The, if the capsule is going to yaw outward, it would be from the knee or the shoulder or maybe wide chest. There's different things that will occur there to cause that to, to toe out or toe in. Pathologies associated with this type of foot. Before I start, I want to make it quite clear that this upright hoof foot has the most pathologies that you will find in horses. Uh, far outnumber so many, so many different types of feet. But when they're upright in the heel like this, you will find, and then the heels are raised, that will increase the pathology damage. So the P3 bone is remodeling in the toe area and the heel area. We have stress to the sole dermis, may develop a thin sole body uh, in the toe and heel area. Stress to the epidermal lamella, terminal papillae, and the white line, and hardening of ungual cartilages, high and low side bone. I like to break side bone down into two areas. High, what I'm referring to as high side bone is usually tension caused by the ligaments that come off of the top of the side, the top of the ungual cartilage that attached to bones. So when that, when the bone column goes forward, the foot's on the ground is going backward. It's kind of going in this direction. See which foot I hand I have here. And then um, as it's pulling back, this toe can pick up leverage and start uh, leveraging out this area here. But the majority of this, this majority of the toe 
Oh, well, I was talking about side bone, excuse me. Uh, that will take the tip of the ungo cartilage and, and pull it forward. When the limbs come forward, the cartilage is pulled forward. That pull forward from those ligaments can actually help the heel come off the ground. All tissues connected. So when one moves, any, they all pull like following, they have to follow. Um, low side bone is usually off of the edge of the P3 bone. That would be in here. This does, this has very little, here's a, here's a young bone without really a side bone developing on it yet. So this will harden, the uncle cartilage will harden, and that's usually caused from um, the stress of the heel movements in this area here. So there's two parts in time that both of those will grow together and uh, become one. Another thing that would, is interesting to look at is that side bone does have direction. <clears throat> P3 bone is in a positive palmar angle. So just remember that uh, this type of foot, this is what I mean is stress developing here. All right, let's talk a few seconds about side bone. It's not part of this discussion. But when a, when a horse has straight bars, straighter bars like this one would have, by the way, this is the bone out of the foot, but the straight bars mean narrow heels. Narrow heels means that the wall is migrating towards the bone and the cartilages. So there's more stress onto those cartilages. Uh, it, you notice that thoroughbred horses, horses that have very low vertical depth to their heel, by that I mean vertical depth in the heel right here. Horses that have low vertical depth to the heel have uh, a lot less side bone. Um, but then look at their heels. Their heels are wide. Why are the heels are wide? Because as the bone loads the top of the bar, the bar angle can change and it will start to widen on the bottom. That will widen the heels of the horse's hoof capsule and that pulls all the, the tissue away from the bone. Now you can widen too much to where the tissue starts to pick up tension and now it's being stretched and you will find the results of that in this area of the bone here, be a lot of rough edges. So the heels are always under stress. We just need to learn how to, to make them so they don't get worse than they actually are. So this is the fun part. So let's look at what do we see here. And I'm going to go through a few things that I would notice when we pick up a foot. So first we have this bar, bar stress in that crack. Now that is excessive sole that's actually breaking off, cracking. Why is it cracking? Because when the bone loads the top of the sole, that will, the sole will flex down. And then in this cause, because the excess sole is dry, it will crack. Now these cracks can penetrate the uh, epidermal sole and that's a more of a serious crack. It doesn't really pull apart like you see in this picture, but it will be more severe internally. So generally a crack will end on the epidermal sole. All of these little cracks here, these are all different layers of the sole. There's a layer, you can see that this layer is under this layer. This layer is under this layer. This layer is above the other layers. So all of these layers can come out through one tissue, single uh, tissue plane. Um, it's not necessary that you have to do that, but it's possible to do that if you wish. We have to protect the foot. So again, it's important on how thin we make the epidermal sole. Another thing Again, these are all these cracks are all caused through sole flexation and there's patterns to crack. So you just have to start studying. Remember that the load to a crack, the stress to a crack are perpendicular. So you just have to look opposites of the crack and figure out what, where your stresses are. I could go on a long time, so we better move on. The next thing we see is flattening through the midsection here, flattening of the sole. Why is this flattening? We'll answer that in a few minutes. Flattening of the sole in the arch, as far as the toe area, is just getting flatter. Here we see bruising in the toe area. That's not a good sign. Bruising in the heel area. You see the darking, darker color of the white line there. It's getting darker yellow. That means stress. 
and then dark yellow, oh, excuse me, dark yellow to the white line is right here. When What that tells us is the distal border, the sensitive lamina is being under stress, and so it's it'll darken up the white line. And if it stays there long enough, the distal border, the sensitive lamina will scar, and then it'll get hard, and then that hard tissue can put pressure onto the uh, dermis of the, of, the, of the P3 bone and, um, and onto bone. It can actually cause a, a bone remodeling. And then just poor nail placements. So let's uh, take a look at this foot after we clean all the tissue out. Now I want to be sure that, that I would you like you to know that this has been trimmed to the sole plane uh, using the uh, principles of, of uniform sole thickness. So what do we see? We first we see, oh, before I go too much any further, uh, if this was a life horse, I would not trim this foot like this. Uh, this horse could probably handle grass okay, and it could probably handle soft ground, but on hard ground, you have to when you have to evaluate the working surface that your horses are going to be on as part of your shoeing protocol. And so you have to learn to protect the foot to deal with those particular type of surfaces. So just remember that this would be a, not a serviceable situation for a horse that has to work on hard ground. So, so we need to learn how to protect these feet. Our goal is to help the horse perform its duties. And to do that, we have to protect its feet and allow it to be able to perform its functions. So here we have the dark trauma to the to the heel quarter area, heel area, uh, the dark yellow tissue. Remember that's stress to the sensitive uh, lamina, and you have to be careful that you don't want to see this. Uh, the next thing we see is this area, the C to corn area, is under stress. This can the sole can thin in this area if it's under stress. The sole has the ability to thicken or thin due to the type of stress that's being applied to it and in the particular areas. The, the sole body that runs through here generally is not uniform in its vertical depth. It will vary. The sole interface with the white line is very uniform in its vertical depth. Here's our poor nail placement. Now what happens to, what is a nail? A nail is a solid piece of material. And so when we drive it into softer tissue, into softer tissue, it has to displace the tissue around the nail. Well, the wall is hard or firm. And so it's hard for the nail to, to displace the tissue on the wall side. So it's only option is to displace tissue on the, the softer portion of the tissue and that means pressure developing so this can be pressure necrosis coming through here caused by damage to soft tissue is something you don't want to see um, nail placing is important for internal as far as internal damage goes to the foot so we should concentrate on on our nail placement um, I put a lot of emphasis if you're not sure you can you can mark through your your nail hole Take the lift the shoe away and see exactly where your nail's going. There's ways of knowing where you are, but try not to get them this close to the hoof because you'll have a problem. The horse may develop problems. Oh, by the way, if a horse comes up three days after it's been shod, pretty much it's a poor place nail. That's pretty common for that. It takes about three days for that pressure to develop to the brain so the brain can pick it up saying, oh, oh. So just look, first thing you do is after three days and the horse is lame is just test your nails and you may find the problem without a lot of extra work. And then let's look at this crack right here. This is our bar crack that we see developing. Now this is a, a kind of a severe crack and this is coming from the bone, P3 bone loading the top of the bar. When the, the bars are always weight bearing. And so when the horse, remember that the horseshoe has very little to do with protecting body weight. The body weight comes down the skeleton and the P3 bone is standing on top of the sole. So a lot of people look at how a foot lands. And if they don't like how it's landing, they can trip off trim the foot to make it land better. 
Horses don't have a problem with their feet landing. The brain will tell them if it's doing just fine. But if it's not landing very well, then I would investigate closer because it may be a problem in like for humans, if you have a little pebble in your shoe, you're gonna alter your walk until you take the pebble out. So before you dictate to a horse on how the foot should land, try to see if maybe there's just a stress problem. You're going to see many problems in this foot right here that, cause a, that could cause a horse to alter its landing. So keep that in mind before you try to dictate to how a foot should land. Remember in humans, if we're, our feet are feeling good, we don't even think about how they're landing. And the same is with horses. Confirmation may tell you it's not, it's not exactly a desired confirmation for what you want. But again, we may have to alter the trim to get what you want. But let's start thinking about what the horse wants a little more. So these bar cracks are important, to, but like I say, that's coming from bone loading internally. What does a horse do? It protects the hoof wall, but it's hollow in the center. So if we're going to advance into more modern farrier science, we need to start discussing internal structures of this foot, things that you will see in this lecture, and the effects that body weight has on top of the sole. Ask yourself, how is the bone landing on top of the sole? That's a very important question. So let's continue. Um, the next thing we're going to see is flattening here in, in this area. Um, I should take my phone and just chuck it out the door because I forgot to shut it off. Give me a second and I don't want to be disturbed. So there we are. So th I, I apologize for that. But how is this flattening? Why is this flattening? Look, look here in this area. You see we have a crease right here, but we don't have that crease here. So if I should just take this little piece of paper for an example and fold it, I can show you a crease. That represents this area here. So how can I eliminate, how can I flatten this crease out on my paper? Well, this would be the bar, or well, let's just call this the area we're talking about right here. So now, if I want to flatten this crease out, I can go inside and push down. And now the crease is flat. And that's really what's happening to this crease. It's flattening out due to the load. Generally speaking, the widest part of the foot is in the area of the midsection where the bone is crushing it down. Um, any movements of the sole, anytime the sole gets pushed out, tissue has to follow. And so the wall will migrate outward. When you see horses that have very broad toe quarters, look closely at the toe arch and it should be flat. So as it flattens out, the toe quarter will broaden. What else happens? This foot will get, the toe will pull back and start to get square. So these are all, all foot shape. Remember that the, the shape of the foot is, is prescribed by the shape of the arch. So as this collapses, the wall's going to alter its shape. It just has to do that. So this is, a, if you want to eliminate the broad toe quarter and the flat toe, you have to figure out a way of improving the toe arch. If you can establish a toe arch back in this foot, that's going to clean, clean these up. A lot of, another thought just came into my head. A lot of people can look at this bone and say, this is a round toe. Well, this is not original bone. You see the P3 bone has different angles on its curves here. So as a young bone has, here's a young bone and it, it's pretty straight. Here's another bo young bone. This is most likely a hind foot, but look how straight it doesn't have the broad toe quarters. This really doesn't have broad toe quarters. This is stressed bone, it's very young, but it's also showing signs of pedalostitis. It needs to be uh, developed more. This bone will change uh, as it grows and develops. Um, 
boy, I just opened another long discussion. I'll get away from it. But anyway, this is not original bone. The toe looks round, but let's remember that this is pilostitis developing all of this. Pilostitis weakens bone, and so it can, it can flare out a little bit. If you look at the side of this bone, you can see how much bone is missing in the toe. So because of these angles change on the parietal surface, as it migrates up, it gets rounder and rounder till it gets maybe to this point and then it's gonna start getting straighter. So don't think that bones are round in the toe. I probably have, I don't know, 600 coffin bones down there in my lab probably. And I bet if you, I could find maybe just one bone that would be round in the toe and not due to um, demineralization. So this area on most, if you're gonna just, I hear a lot of people shoe the bone, shoe the shape of the bone. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing, but it makes me laugh because they're not taking into consideration how bone demineralizes and how much bone shape can change to a horse's lifetime. So let's keep that in mind too. So what else are we looking at here? We have hot spots in here. So it's quite possible for, you see as this bone rounds, rounds up here, that means that this and this is longer than this. And these long points can press into the sole here and here and cause sole thinning uh, and stress to the dermis. Uh, and then stress to the dermis could be inflammation. Again, a flattening and rounding of the sole area in the toe. So if you look right across here, you can see that it looks like it's rounding a little bit. Here's a stress spot coming from the bone internally. See that change in tissue right there? That's a stress spot, stress spot. So all of this is starting now. The bone's pushing into the top of the sole, causing it to wrap around bone. And then that's again going to cause uh, inflammation. Then we see stress to the sole dermis, soul and body. You won't see that, but we will in a few minutes. And then cracks in the toe area. Cracks, another thing that's quite interesting because so many of them can be man-made. So again, if you want to increase the stress of a toe crack, raise the heels. Decrease the stress on a toe crack, lower the heels. I'm not saying this for my... Um, experience. My nose, is, my nose is really itching today. What I'm saying is um, just observe and compare. Take a horse that's got a toe crack, clean up the toe quarters and lower the heels and most likely the tack crack will go away. It'll disappear. It won't be immediate, it, but stay true to your trim and maybe two or three trims later you'll find that oh it doesn't have these blown out toe quarters it doesn't have a, a stress in the toe area so you've just taught yourself how to create toe cracks haven't you if i want to create a toe crack I'll, i want a bit bone to crush down internally uh, there's ways i can do that by changing stance have the horse stand further back and you're going to get more bone pressure on the toe area have the horse stand forward and you'll release the pressure on the toe area of the bone, but increase the pressure in the heel area of the bone. I'm really getting off track on this lecture, sorry. And then so we, we'll see shear to the white line, uh, stress to the epidermal lamella, lamella, terminal papillae and the white line. And this is what, this is the dermis out of this foot. So let's look closely. Here's the same foot and this is the dermis that's been removed. So let's, this is a hole I drill, so don't worry about it. Um, uh, this is a study I'm doing. This is the hole that, this is the sensitive frog, or the horny frog right there is here. And then I will drill a hole right at the tip of the horny frog, uh, the sensitive frog. And then when I clean out the bones, well, you'll probably see the holes in a few minutes. And then, so here we have, we talked about dark yellow in the white line area, and this is the damage you see taking place. Here's swelling to the sole dermis and rounding of the bone. Here's the irritation in the midsection. So we talked about this area having stress, it's flattening out. This is the irritation that's occurring inside. 
Now, if a veterinarian should put his hoof testers in this area, he may diagnose navicular syndrome or navicular disease. For as much navicular disease as I've seen diagnosed on feet, I've seen very little, that a lot less percentage-wise in navicular bones. Mostly it's damage to the midsection here and stress. So these nerves will pick up pain. The sensory nerves will send the information to the brain saying this hurts, especially when the vet puts pressure on it. But the horse has a way of numbing out the nerves. The nerves eventually just get crushed out and that kind of goes away. This is common. Very, very common. Once you become uh, aware of it, you'll see it a lot more than you want. Modern farrier science, we have ways of, of, of helping this area, not preventing it from happening, but helping it, help, helping it be stronger and longer. We have, then here's our swelling to the to dermis in the toe area, and you can see uh, tissue breaking down in the toe area. Remember, we have a toe crack here. That's a vibration. This is this can be caused by vibration. So if you were to look inside the sole body, you may see hardening of tissue in this, in, just in the area of the white line and, or the, the, um, the sensitive lamina. You'll see hardening of tissue there or scarring that can put pressure into this area here. These are not always in the center of the foot. They can be up to over to one side or other side, things like that. There's no rule to where that's going to be. And now I don't think I had my cursor working on that one. I saw it. But then here's pressure coming off of. So remember that the deeper the comma sewers, the more positive angle there will be to the P3 bone. And the more stress, then, then the load will develop more forward onto your sole dermis. Positive P3 angles can have very negative effects on bone and on soft tissue. Sole plane. So this is our foot before trim, and the foot's been trimmed to a level trim. This is teaching. So all our textbooks say we trim a level foot for a level shoe. But modern, trying to improve our industry, develop it into more modern farrier science, let's take a look at uniform sole thickness and what it means, UST. So here's a foot that's been trimmed to UST. Remember that the trim for the sole plane and the trim to UST are identically the same trim. They just have different meanings. So we're gonna advance into understanding what the meaning of uniform sole thickness means. So this is after trim. This is not a level foot. Well, if I were to trim, you see it's not a level foot. If I were to trim this foot level like this farrier trim this foot, I'm missing all of this important information. So what does this mean to us? Well, look at all these wrinkly lines here. Those wrinkly lines mean that the toe's under stress, that the bone most likely is pushing into the sole arch in the toe area and that the toe is wanting to bend around the bone the sole will bend around the bone of then of course that's going to affect the hoof wall so we can remove the hoof capsule and take a close look here's our uniform sole thickness coming through here it represents it tells us that the sole is bent in this direction the straighter the side walls the, the straighter the side walls What's that force the sole to do? It has to bend somewhere, so it's bending upward. If this wall angle were to change and to come out, this would straighten out. We may not be able to control that, but in most cases, we can help this foot develop differently, but we have to get away from a lot of our traditional thinkings to do that. And when I say traditional thinkings, I also mean that we need to get away from a lot of the traditional arguments that go along with traditional thinking. Open our mind, start looking at today and the, and the information we lear we're learning today. We have to have an open mind. There's more than one way to, to, to trim a foot, but each way has advantages and disadvantages. And we have to keep that in mind. So I want to show you in a few minutes what this effects has on bone. 
and it's just so UST is all the principles behind uniform soap thickness is just to d denote the um, the distortions to the soul plane. That's all it is. The trim is the soul plane, called the soul plane. And let's look at this bone. Here's a bone with a full toe. This is not. This bone is not touching the platform. Why is it developing like this? Well. If we were to look at the angles in the arch, the arch is like this. It's a narrow, uh, we can see that this has a curved arch and straight sidewalls. The angles of the white line here, or this is actually the white line's been removed. Uh, there's ways of identifying when the white line is off of the sole body. And look how steep these angles are to the sole edge of the sole. So that means it's a steeper sole steeper angles. Let's place the bone on this foot and you will get an idea of why the bone, where the pressure is on the P3 bone and causing it to, to demineralize in this area. Because there's two ways the bone can demineralize. I showed you this, the movement here, the bone moving, getting this upward bend here. Well, that's because of this plane. Positive palmar angles will cause this, this to demineralize narrow walls causing the bone, straight side walls causing the, the arch to go in this direction can demineralize the bone in this direction. And in some cases you can have both, both occurring to the P3 bone. And then this is key. The distal border of the P3 bone is below the proximal edge the proximal border of the white line. Now the tissue has been removed, so this bone is not exactly this low, this elevation, it'll have a little more elevation, but you're seeing the effects it has to the P3 bone. Before trim, let's look at a lateral view. A lateral is simply furthest away from the body. So if we were to look at this foot, uh, this would be our lateral side and it's a level trim. If I come over here and, and incorporate the principles behind uniform sole thickness, we have now identified distortion to the sole plane. We need to learn how to work this distortion out. Basically, we need to learn how to prevent this distortion from occurring. If you want to shear a heel, unequal shear a heel, unequal heel lengths in the heel will do it. The long heel will be the sheared heel, will drive the, the the hoof car, the, the cartilages of the foot further up. If you want to put a uh, bend in the toe, raise the heel, just raise the heel and give it time and it should develop. So here's our distorted sole plane showing the effects of uniform sole thickness, identifying the distortion. This is the effects of a poor nail placement right there. This is pressure necrosis showing up. And if you can look closely right in here, you can see that the distal border, the sensitive lamina is starting to, to harden, to scar and get hard. Again, if that gets hard enough, the toe cracks will do the same thing if it's involved in the white line. But if it gets hard enough, then it will scar the tissue and that can put a uh, damage the bone, uh, the area of the bone. Just mentioned our, our poor nail placement. Now let's look again at the upward movement and the toe and you notice and heel area because right now the way the foot is placed on the platform, it looks like we have a bend in both the toe and the heel, but that has to do with stance. If this horse was standing a little bit forward, then it would show the bend all in the toe area. If this horse was standing back, then it would show the bend in the heel area. So we have to know how to define it. So we go back to uniform sole thickness and it's actually telling us what? It looks like the bend is primarily in the toe area because if this horse would stand forward, this is pretty level up to this point. And from this point, then it's, it's migrating up. And this is the effects it'll have on bone, bone modeling to the stresses. So we're losing the toe uh, to the P3 bone through pedalostitis. Uh, morphology of the soul, we said morphology is the, the shape, is, is the study of shape. So the P3 bone being in a positive palmar angle 
is be and that is because this horse has deep comma sewers, which means a lot of depth to the bars. Here's what I'm talking about. Deep connoisseurs, a lot of depth to the bar, puts the P3 bone in a positive palmar angle, driving it into the toe. This horse, if you remember before trim, how much it healed it had on it. So length of wall increased the damages here. And this is our soul. This is, happens to be one of the holes I drill. Now, after I drill the holes, the holes are all drilled by hand. And so when I drill the hole, I have to cut the sole in half and evaluate the angle of my drill. So this is not totally vertical. So what are my options? I have a measuring program. So I could, um, I could adjust this portion on a vertical from my, this portion and pull it back a little bit. Or if it's too far off, I can just throw it out and do another one, which is mostly the case. But look at this. Look, this is the whole astronomer. Look at the, the sinking that's taking place here by this bone being in this position with the toe, with the sole starting to wrap around. See the sole right here wrapping around bone. So look how thin the sole's developing because of the pressure that's there. This is more like the sole depth should be here. And this bone, this sole is thinning due to the pressure that's being applied to the bone. And then we can look at the depth, what I'm talking about here on the, on the positive palmar angle of the P3 bone. Again, if we want to make this worse, let's go back to how this foot originally was trimmed with lots of heel and look at the damage that you're seeing occurring. This is, this is proof positive that the heel is destroying, that the morphology of the foot, the deep commissures and, and, the, and the trimming technique that was applied to this, like quarter horses, let's trim their short, toes short and raise them up in the heel. And then how long do they get to use that horse before it breaks down? It's just a shame. It, it's actually more than a shame that they do quarter horses like that. And they do the same thing to mules. If anyone ever look in a mule's foot, they would say, uh-uh, we shouldn't leave the heels on them. The problem is it's good. if it gets out of your control, it's going to go back. We can help horses through control, but we can't let them go five to eight weeks long. We've lost control. We've got to, in limit, we've got to shorten that shoeing cycle. So just keep that in mind. So stance. This is the foot before trim. It's all up. Remember, we talked about this foot before trim with this all. This is not uniform sole thickness. That means it had heels. If we were to follow the moisture line, it would come right along to here. So from here, put my cursor. If we were to follow the moisture line, it would come right up through here. So that means all of this is excessive heel right here. It's raised up. Poor horse is raised up. It's walking on its toe. And this is with the heels trimmed. So much more comfortable. Look, just look how comfortable that looks. Well, maybe it's my eye that sees it comfortable. I'm sorry if you're not seeing it. But I would much rather want to stand on the, on the ground like this and on my toe all day. I just wouldn't want to do this. It, it would get to my brain and then you wouldn't be able to be around me because I'd be too grumpy. Get away from me. Don't pick up my foot. You're hurting it. Don't catch me in a stall because I know you're going to hurt my feet. <laughs> Things like that. But when we t use, incorporate the, you know, the principles here of UST and our foot goes and the horse should stand a little bit forward and our foot levels off, then we definitely can identify the toe bend. And it's an upward bend in the sole. It's not really so much in the toe. It's really in the, in the I mean, in the heel. It's mostly in the toe area. So let's go back to distortion, distorted sole plane. The P3 bone is below the proximal border of the white line in the toe area. If we should set a goal, our goal could be try to level the sole plane. Because once you get, a, it's going to be a different foot. You're not going to see that short toe on them and then want all these feet to have a short toe. The reason this foot is short in the toe is because bone is demineralizing. If bone is demineralizing, the foot's going to get shorter. So let's not confuse that and make all feet look like a bone that has a demineralized toe. Let's make all feet look like a bone that's got a full bone in it. So let's get away from these. See, for so many years, 
all our teaching comes from looking at the outside of a foot. That has to change. Bone, vertical depth of bone. If I'm losing, ver not me, <laughs> oh, not me. But if we're losing vertical depth in the heel, then your heel's not going to, and the bone anyway. If See, if you're losing vertical depth to this bone here, then you're not going to have much vertical depth to your, to your capsule externally. If you're losing vertical depth to the bone in the toe, you're not going to have much vertical depth to the bone internally. That means you're going to have a capsule that looks like a short toe. That's what everybody wants. It's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. You know how important the toe is. More studies need to be done away from these long-toed horses or, or, or breakover. Breakover is screwing up the, some of these people ideas on breakover on how, on the capsule are just screwing feet up. And then that's going to affect the, ter, the thing. We need educated people that know the structure of the foot internally, that have an idea of how feet change internally before they do studies. You know, I'm here, I'm still alive. I don't know how many more years, but I'm more than happy to help people do studies. I'm not going to help them in their study, but I can shorten your learning curve. So if the way things are should to, to compare different structures internally. So with that knowledge, then do your study on on toe length and breakover, because this definitely ha this foot right here definitely has a false measurement on toe length because of the damage to the bone. Oh, I get sometimes, you know, many years I've been looking at feet, you wouldn't think I'd get upset, but I apologize. So let's go on, let's get this finished. So our level sole plane. So leveling the sole plane should be one of our modern techniques in, in horseshoeing. And then we're just using this for an example. Now what's that? Oh, there we go. So look, I have a, a lecture on heels. You probably have to find which one it is as time progresses. So I don't want to get involved in lecturing the heels. But the frog wall junction is quite unique because it will align with the moisture line. So when you stand in the back of a foot and you look at the separation between the frog and the wall, there'll be that's the frog wall junction. And that will give you an idea of how the foot is standing on its foot. So if we look, and this takes experience, you just can't look at every horse and say, oh, there it is. You have to know what you're looking at. So just listen today and then study what I'm saying tomorrow and, and find these areas. But you notice that the frog wall junctions are the same. So this horse has less heel on the left side of your foot than it has on the right side of your foot that's altering the plane of the capsule. And that can have major effects on bone. After trimming to the sole plane or trimming to uniform sole thickness, we can see that we do not have a level sole plane on this horse. And it all, it's needs a lot of help. These need to be leveled off. Maybe that's why they're putting all these grooves in the outside of the foot because the horse may have had a problem. So shearing to the dermal lamina. So as the bone sinks into the foot, what's going to happen to the lamina? It's going to get pulled apart, pulled away from the wall. And that's what we see here. And then here we can see where the bone actually is in this foot. Can you see how the capsule is now developing a short looking toe? It's not a natural development, it's caused by pathologies within the foot, damage and stress taking place within the foot that is shortening the, the wall length in the toe area. Plus the bend has shortened it quite a bit. If that bend is allowed to settle down, that toe will straighten out and you'll have a more of a healthier looking toe. So these are the effects of pilostitis when the bone is sinking into the foot. And this is the distal portion, and it can pull and break bone away or separate bone from its main body. So all of these are stress fractures, either caused by uh, compression or by tension. These are the holes I was talking about that I drilled. So this would be the sense of the horny frog. Uh, let me get a, here's our, our luge. These are the holes that I drill. So this is the horny frog, and this is the sensitive frog. And you can see they don't align. Even this little tiny baby 
is off alignment. It's not aligned. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the P3 bone has a, uh, a little different movement inside the capsule than the hoof wall tells us. And then we're put, placing the bone. We can look at this now. We can uh, add some areas of stress. <clears throat> so this area of stress is tearing apart lamina, sensitive tissue. It's also affecting bone through pilostitis. Here we see the effects of the bone crushing in the midsection, causing our bark abscesses to develop. Right here, this is causing uh, this is the crushing in the midsection, causing our bar abscess to develop, and we can see pathology developing right in this area, both areas primarily. And then this area of stress, remember. Remember that there's ligaments attaching the uh, collateral ligaments. A collateral ligament really holds joints together. It holds bones together on the sides. And so we have stress there. Now, what? let me, as a teacher, would it do me any good to tell you what ligament that is? See, I would tell you, if you're in my class, I wouldn't tell you what ligament that is. I would tell you to come tomorrow and tell me what ligament is. You see, if you have to go and look this information up, I'm doing you a favor. Because now your eye is sending information to your brain. <laughs> but if I tell you what that ligament is, what's it going to do? It's going to go into this ear, most likely out this ear, and I'm not helping you at all. So if you want to know what's causing this stress, go to your textbook and tell, find it out. Check it out. Very simple answer to this stress. And then we could go back and look at how the foot was trimmed to see what's putting this tissue under tension. Good projects. And then here's the top of that sole. And we can go, we can add a few things to it. Now here's the effects of the bone and a positive palmar angle, but sinking into the toe. This is the effects. Remember we said there was hot spots on the sole body. This is the effects of the high points on the sole because the bone, again, let me remind you, the bone is, we're losing bone here, so we don't have a level surface for equals, equal stress development. Our stress now, since this is disappearing, our stress is here and here on those high, on these high spots here and here. Can you see that? So look at the curvature of this bone. Right here, this isn't the bone out of that foot, but right here, it's mimicking what we have here. Straight sidewalls and a curve in our bone here, demineralization of the bone. So it has an, a kind of an arch with a bone and a forward pitch on the arch. And then there's the stress bumps for the bone loading through the midsection, or not stress bumps, but uh, the stressed area of uh, where the bar abscesses were occurring. And then here's stress in our heel area. We showed you all that on our before trim. So let's look at soft tissue here. On our, and then you can see the damage here through the midsection. We can see rounding, we can see the bone is pressing in here, causing this to the sole to wrap around bone, causing this curvature here. Here we have some stress inflammation in the toe area and rounding to the dermis, which is causing stress to the bone in this area. So let me just take a minute to get a breath. And now we can do, uh, what do you see, a review? Trauma, heel trauma, dark yellow tissue. Stress to the sole area. Pressure or poor nail placement. Our bar crack. Our flattening in the midsection. Our hot spots. Our flattening and rounding of the toe in the toe area, in the toe area. You could, like I say, right here, you can see the bone. You can see the bone right here, pressing deep, hard into the sole. And, and the reason why you can see it a little clear is because we just showed you sole thinning in that area. And then stress into that area with the dermis. We showed you the swelling to the dermis and then the toe crack. And I hope we try to answer. There's patterns to toe cracks. So when you see a toe crack, look at the, look how the foot, the wall length is growing out beyond the sole plane and look at the, 
the wall length most likely will be longer off of the sole plane in the toe quarter areas than it will be in the toe area. You see, when you trim the toe short and leave heel, how does that affect the regrowth of your wall? It's amazing. The toe quarters will get longer than your toe. So you just have to watch for these things and learn how to control them to protect the foot. And then shear to the white line is never a good sign. That's stress to the epidermal line, la, lamella and terminopapilla in the white zone. So I hope this will be helpful in your work. And I hope this is just another step forward in our modern, in our learning of modern day farrier science. These are, these are what our researchers should start looking at. So when you look at the outside of a foot, you just see a, you could call it like a block of wood. I think some people look at it like that. But when you, and that all our teachings is based on the outside of the foot. What kind of shoes should we put on this foot to make the foot do what? Well, every, the, for every action, there's a reaction. For every shoe you put on a foot, you're going to have a reaction to whatever leverages that you put on that shoe. So that our job, is, no, we need to use the shoes. But our job is to advance us into an area to where we can protect the inner structures and the soft, sensitive structure that's so fragile and delicate. We need to protect that so we can get away with using the shoes that we want to use for gait performances or anything else like that. I'm sorry, it's one of those days I just got a little carried away and I'm, I apologize for that. I wanna help the horse and I wanna, basically I would like to be able to help you help horses. So thank you again. And uh, we'll do another one soon.